I just want to announce my name's not Carrie Roberts. Some of you are going, were we supposed to have a concert today? We had a, a recording artist, Carrie Roberts, who was supposed to be with us today. She's going to be with us all day. And, uh, you know, she's pretty big time stuff, country, or not country, Christian Music Award Dove winner type of a person. And we found out earlier in the week that she was sick on Wednesday. She was running a high fever, didn't have a voice, and still is sick today. So uh, on Wednesday afternoon, we made a plan B. So orchestra and choir are on uh, without a whole lot of notice, and, uh, and I'm preaching today. So if, if you came to hear Carrie Roberts and you don't want to sit through my sermon, I'll, uh, everybody will close their eyes, you can walk out, leave, and uh, nobody will think anything. Uh... <laughs> there we go, turn out the lights. Why are you all still sitting here? <laughs> So pray for her, and uh, it's a postponed thing. We'll, we'll uh, let you know of a later date when she's able to come, and we'll be doing that later. So, so you got me, you're stuck with me today, and uh, I, uh, as you heard, Jeannie and I had our 30-year wedding anniversary this past Monday. Interesting thing is uh, Jim and Deb Christensen, Jim and Deb celebrated their 30th anniversary on the same exact day. We got married on the same day, only different parts of the country, so... Congratulations to you guys. Mike and Emily Klingensmith, yesterday was their first anniversary. Yeah, congratulations, guys. So it's a big anniversary week. Anybody else have anniversaries this week? All right, back here. We got anniversaries all over the place. Happy anniversary. June used to be a big wedding month, and not so much anymore. All right, can you guys, like, wake up and talk to me a little bit? Hey, thank you, thank you, thank you. We are uh, going to be in our, continuing our series in 1 Corinthians, and if you have a Bible and want to turn there, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The title of the message today is, By All Means Possible. We're jumping ahead a little bit in uh, 1 Corinthians, tonight Pastor Weaver will be sharing from chapter 7, and uh, we'll kind of get everything back on track here, but... With the change of plans, uh, this, is, this is where we're at today, and uh, I'm really uh, honored to be able to share this morning. Uh, this passage of Scripture, chapter 9, let me first read, we're going to read verses 19 to 23. Paul says, though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I become like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those having the law, I became like one, or to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all means, all possible means, I might save some. I do all of this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. So we skipped over a few verses earlier in chapter 9, and if you have time to go back and read that, I'd encourage you to, uh, to do so. But what, um, what Paul is saying earlier, he's kind of setting up uh, just where, he, where he's kind of culminating here at the end of the chapter. Uh, Paul is a pretty big, big-time apostle, and you know we have over half of the books of the New Testament written by him. Um, Paul saw Christ, the risen Christ, and uh, actually the church in Corinth exists largely because of, of uh, his uh, ministry there and uh, planting churches, uh, in, in this area is largely attributed to Paul. Paul talks about how, you know, as, a, as an apostle, he has certain rights, and there's things that as an apostle, and he's talking about earning his income that way. There are a lot of them that do that. Paul, uh, on the other hand, um, didn't take those rights or those liberties, and he, he, he boasted in the fact that he would preach for free. When you read about Paul here through this chapter, especially, but all throughout the New Testament, you know, everything was about the gospel, about the gospel going forth. And he said, look, if I, I'll, I'll put up with anything, I'll go through anything just so that the gospel can go forward. 
So what you get in the earlier part of chapter 9 is the fact that he could be paid for his ministry, but he's not. Uh, just like providing meals, living in people's homes, doing whatever it is, getting some kind of compensation. He's saying, look, a farmer uh, who plants crops uh, is able to share in the, the fruit of his crops. Um, that's, that's just a natural kind of a thing. Not only is it uh, kind of a natural way that things work, but God set it up that way, and he's saying, look, I could be taking advantage of this, but I'm just not. Uh, I'm thankful here that uh, our church uh, compensates us as pastors very well so that we can focus on our, our, our ministry and what we do uh, rather than having to work a 40-hour-a-week job and then um, try to do ministry, uh, and it's not impossible. A lot of people do that in my uh, I have great respect for people who are bivocational in ministry, but our church allows us to do that, and I very, very, we're all very appreciative of that. Um, but here's, here's Paul saying, you know, I'm free. I don't, I don't belong to anybody. I don't report to anybody other than the fact that I'm, I make myself a slave to everybody. I've got freedoms, and I can do whatever I want to. You can read in other parts of 1 Corinthians where he says, you know, everything is permissible for me. I can do anything that I want to. Not everything is beneficial and not everything is constructive. And uh, here he's making a point for the fact that uh, what, his, what his mission and what his goal is, is that the gospel uh, go forward. And that is, that is what he's setting it up here. He's saying, I'm compelled to take the gospel. I'm compelled by God. That's, this is his mission for my life, and that's what I intend to do. So the, kind of the key verse for what we're, what we're looking at today is verse 22 of chapter 9 where Paul says, I become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I become all things to all people. If we take that statement by itself, it could seem to imply that Paul's willing to do anything to reach the lost. That there's no limits, there's no boundaries, there, I, can, I will do whatever I can. And it would seem to justify some Christians today whose uh, lifestyles, a, a worldly lifestyle, uh, is permissible as long as it's uh, reaching people and saving someone. And so, you know, I, I kind of wonder, is this true? Is it true that I can do anything as long as it uh, reaches people? Should we be willing to become all things to all people? So on the surface, that's what that statement says it's what it looks like, but let me, let me uh, look at it this way. Would a Christian be justified in, in doing drugs to reach people who are selling or doing drugs? Would that be permissible? Would, um, would a Christian be justified in using profanity or crass language to reach today's youth culture because that's the kind of language that they use and I'm just trying to be re relevant and relate? Man, you guys are much more vocal. Oh, was that, was that you? Yeah, I heard it the first time. You did? <laughs> would, it be, would it be okay for a Christian to dress provocatively because that's how a lot of people in our culture dress in order to reach people for the gospel of Christ? All right, here we go. That, you guys are much more awake now. First, first Corinthians 9.22 uh, means that a Christian can do anything if the goal is to win the lost. If that's the case then the answer to all these questions would be yes. But you all said it's no, so we're going to explore that a little bit. If, if the answer is yes, then the Christians could find themselves violating a whole lot of other uh, standards and scriptures that are laid out in the New Testament. For instance, Romans 12, 2 says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you. In Ephesians chapter 5, he says several, Paul says several things. Imitate God in everything that you do. Follow the example of Christ. Be careful how you live, not as fools, but as wise. Don't act thoughtlessly. In James 4, 4, he says, friendship with the world makes you what? An enemy of God. So what looks like on the, on the surface, you know, I, anything possible, by any means possible, we see that, it, you know, taken in the light of, of Scripture in the context that it is, it can't really mean that. It can't mean that there's no limits to what a Christian can do to win the loss. So, like a lot of verses, if it doesn't make sense, 
uh, look at in the light of other scripture, look at what the context is. And as we, as we look at the context of what Paul is saying here, it's exactly what he means uh, when he's saying that all things, I want to become all things to all people. He says this, to the Jews, I become like a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not myself being under the law, that I might win those under the law. So he knew that uh, he no longer had the restrictions. He had been a Jew, he had become a, a born again believer through Jesus Christ, and all of a sudden now in, the, in Christ, the law doesn't pertain to him in that way. So he's not under the law. But he said, look, in order to relate to those, to those Jewish people, I'll just live by their customs. I'll live by their sin. So I'm, when I'm with them, that's what I'm gonna do. Even though I don't live by that law anymore. I'm not under that law. So that's, that's, that's it. But when you go outside of that, when Paul then went to the Gentiles, he's saying, look, when I'm with the Gentiles, they, they don't have this law. And if I were to live under the law, then I would be, I would be oppressing them. There were people known, known as Judaizers who, who were uh, taking these newborn Christians and saying, look, yeah, but you still got to live with this law. But Christ came to set them free from that. And so he's saying, so when I'm with these people who are, who are outside the law, I, I live like them. But he's saying, but even though, even though you know, I'm reaching people who are outside the law, I still live under the law of Christ. It doesn't give me freedom just to do whatever and live however and live like the people that I'm around. So it would be counterproductive for him to live as a Jew in, with the Gentiles and vice versa. So the best application that I can put to this is you know, we've got missionaries. We've had a number of missionaries who have come here in the last couple of years who are um, missionaries to parts of the Middle East and they're reaching into, uh, into cultures that are predominantly Muslim. And some of our missionary ladies who are there uh, will wear the hijab, the, the headdress, while they're in that culture because that's something that is very valuable and sacred to them. Are they doing something immoral by covering their head? No. And the only thing that, the only reason they're doing that is to, to connect. So really, what, what Paul is saying here is not so much uh, by any means I can do whatever I want to. What, he, what we find out is that Paul is restricting himself more than letting himself be, live permissively. So he's giving up rights more than taking advantage of the freedoms that he has through Christ. So for a, a woman to go and minister in a culture that's predominantly Muslim and to cover her head only just says, I, I connect and I, I'm, I'm valuing what you value and I'm gonna live in that. It's not causing me to, to, to live differently than my faith, but I'm showing respect to the culture that I'm, that's here. If she were to go and say, look, I've got freedom to live however I want to and dress however I want to, she's gonna be shunned and rejected in that culture. So, like I said, Paul was speaking restrictively, not permissively. The entire chapter, as we read chapter 9, Paul is deny him, denying himself rights. Verse 12, he's talking about the right to the financial compensation that I was talking about. He said, we've never used this right. Rather, we'd rather put up with anything than be an obstacle to the good news of Christ. And in verse 15, he says, yet I've never used any of these rights and I'm writing this you to suggest that I don't want to start this, I don't want to start it now. So I'm going to continue to live this way, and it's been of my own will and my own uh, choosing to lay down these rights so that I can reach lost people. In 1 Corinthians 10, 23, he said, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is constructive. So he begins this uh, section on becoming all things by saying, oh, for though I am free, and belong to no one, I've made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. So in context, everything Paul is saying has to do with, like I said, restricting himself for the sake of other people. I'm gonna give up my right to be able to do this in order to win as many people as possible. His heart and his mission is for other people. A lot of people use this passage today to live in a, in a permissive way, to, make, uh, 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 to justify their behavior. But with Paul, it's the exact opposite. He said, I give up what I want and what I'm entitled to in order to reach people who need the gospel of Jesus Christ. What he's saying is even when he lives among these Gentiles, he's still a New Testament believer and he isn't free to do anything that they that they're doing around him 
So he's willing to serve anyone, willing to give up his rights for the sake of the gospel. And Timothy, to Timothy, he wrote this, 1 Timothy 4.16. Keep a close watch, Timothy, on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. So there was a, no amount of pain that Paul wasn't willing to go through in order to let the message of the gospel and winning people to Christ. So God could have chosen a whole lot of ways to take the gospel to the world. And maybe we have ideas of how that could be better, but what he did was he chose people who have been saved to go and take the message to people who were lost. He chose saved people to tell lost people about the message. And so in the text that we're looking at today, I want to, I want to talk about two things. One is this. There's a goal that we must own, and there is a message that we must proclaim. The first thing is this, a goal that we own. And that goal is what Paul said, by all possible means, I might save some. So he sums this up by saying, I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. And as we read these words, I, I, I want us to ask this question. Is that my goal? Is that your goal? Is it your goal, as Paul said, I become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some? And maybe you're wondering, should that be my goal? Isn't that just something that the apostles did or something that missionaries or people that are really good at doing evangelism, isn't that something that they do? Well, see, the Bible tells us that Jesus came to seek and save the lost, right? And it also talks about how we, as followers of Christ, should desire and grow to be more like him in our lives. Think of a, a few scriptures. Jesus said in John 15, 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. 1 John three sixteen. this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. In Romans eight twenty nine, he says, um, God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says that we with unveiled faces, we reflect the Lord's glory more and more. We're being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. So as we follow Christ, whose mission is to seek and save lost people, the more we grow like him and the more we grow as Christians to become like him, we adopt the same thing. So if he's about seeking and saving lost people, guess what we should be about? Seeking and saving lost people. And the more closely we follow, the more we will find ourselves becoming like him. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 32, do not cause anyone to stumble. Don't stumble anyone, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. Even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. And then he immediately follows that up by saying, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Be imitators of me, some versions say, as I imitate Christ. So we're to become more and more like him. We're to have his heart and we're to do the things that he does. So yes, this should be a goal of all of us who claim Jesus Christ as our savior, who have been saved by him. So to answer that question, the answer is yes, that should be our goal. And let me, let me just uh, ask you to consider four things about this goal of becoming all things to all people so that by all possible means, we might win some. First thing is that that goal is a realistic goal. Even Paul, as, as gifted as he was to speak and as gifted as he was to minister, he never does say that he is going to win everyone to Christ. He did, it win to aim, he, did, he did aim to win some. And those some that he wins will win some others, and they will win some others as well. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, 15, he says, we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ. Our lives as Christians, as believers, as followers of Christ, we have a Christ-like aroma to us, a fragrance that rises up to God. And the reality is, is that that fragrance is perceived differently by different people. You can read in, in 2 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16, he says, this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. To those perishing, we are a dreadful smell of death and doom. But to those who are being saved, we are a life-giving perfume. 
I think about it like this. My, my dad's father was a farmer. And uh, we're, we all, most all of us here, I'm sure, are from Iowa. And though most of us probably live in the city, on certain days we get some smells that kind of come in from the country, right? We know, we know the smells of Iowa. And so growing up as a kid being in rural Iowa, I remember in the car just going, ah, plugging my nose because we drove by a hog farm or something like that. And what we think smells terrible to that farmer, my grandpa used to say when, when we would all complain about the smell, he would say, it smells like money to me. <laughs> so depending on your perspective, one, it might smell one way to one person and completely different to another. And, and Paul's talking in 2 Corinthians, he's saying that this is it. Our lives have this, this uh, Christ-like aroma to them. But listen, not everybody's gonna take that aroma the same way. There's some people that are gonna be offended. Some people is gonna draw them to Christ and some people are gonna be completely offended. It's good news to some and repulsive to others. So Paul knew that there would be some people who would accept the message and some people who would flat out reject it. And so Paul, is, this realistic goal is that he might win some. And that helps us a little bit to not feel like we've got just this heap mound of pressure on us. You know, not, not one of us can win the city of Des Moines on our own, let alone the world, the whole world around us. So we look at it like that, and and, and it's an enormous task. But I can be God's instrument in saving some. What I want to encourage you to is to begin praying for those that you have contact with that don't know Christ. And here's the deal, all of us, this should be all of our goal, if we claim Jesus Christ as our Savior, we're on a mission and our mission should be as Christ to seek and save the lost, meaning that we're gonna, on our own heart, we're gonna, we're gonna take people and we're gonna pray for them and we're gonna do everything that we can to see them come to Christ. You might be rejected. That is a very good possibility. But you have no idea if you don't take this mission who might be saved because of that mission that you take. I wanna encourage each of you today, this morning, as I'm talking, even just on your notes there, just write the names of, of, of maybe two to five people that you know don't know Christ and that you will commit to from now until um, you're not able to anymore to pray for those people. And you're gonna pray for them daily. And it's not like you gotta spend like a half an hour in prayer for each one of them. Just take their names and pray for them. Just repeat their name. It may take you a minute a day to do that. But let them be on your mind and in your prayers and be praying for an opportunity where you can step into that moment and be able to share your faith with them. It's It's a realistic goal. Second thing that it is, not only a realistic goal, but it's a worthy goal. There's nothing more worthy of your time and effort than helping someone get in right relationship with God. If you can help someone get into a right relationship with God, there's nothing more worthy that you can spend your time on. Nothing will help the world more than leading people to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. Nothing will help a family more than leading a family member to a, a right relationship with Christ. And so Paul says, by all possible means to save some. And so what he's saying is, I'm giving up my rights, I'm laying down some things that I could do, some things that how I could live, how I could act, in order that people come to know Christ. Whether it be your friends, your family, your coworkers, your neighbors, we all have people in our life that aren't following Christ. Let's, let's use our time and effort uh, to, to minister to them. Not only is it a realistic goal and a worthy goal, but it's a, a crucial goal. What could be more crucial than saving lives? If a person's not saved spiritually, what are they? They're lost. They're doomed. They're damned. Those are the only choices. They're either saved or they're not. Saved or they're lost. We're not talking about a a temporary situation either. We're talking about an eternal situation. If we say that we believe the Bible and we follow Jesus as our Lord, we can't escape the fact that there is an eternal hell that is an awful place. Jesus died for us to be able to receive heaven as a reward. But the reality is if we're not on our way to heaven, there is a hell. And it's a real place. It's a real thing, it's a real consequence. And it's an awful place. Jesus speaks of it as an unquenchable fire. 
where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. He shared the story about a rich man who, who came to Abraham and said, Father Abraham, send my, my servant Lazarus. Just that he would dip his finger in the water and just a drop of water on my tongue because uh, I, I'm tormented in this place. And he said, Tell him to send somebody, send somebody to my brothers. I have five brothers, and I want somebody to go and tell them to change their lives and go a different course because I don't want them to come here. You'll have to go back and read that story. Jesus is saying, look, if they didn't listen to you now, they're not going to listen to them now. So we all have a choice. And it's not just a temporary thing. It's an eternal consequence that we're talking about. Romans chapter 2, verse 5 Uh, Paul says, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Do we really truly believe that there's going to be a time when God pours out his wrath? It's a massive worldview change from the world that we live in, the way people think today. There really is coming a day when God's wrath is going to be poured out. His righteous judgment is going to be given. And Paul says that everyone is going to give an account of himself to God. Every one of us. Everyone in this world. And there's only two verdicts. There's only two sentences. You're either guilty or not guilty. And there's either eternal life or it's eternal punishment. So how do we look at life? You know, the contrary, or the the popular way of looking at this today, a lot of of people in a lot of churches today kind of just do away with hell. They think it's just something that, you know, it's just kind of a figurative thing, and they don't, they, they act like and talk like there absolutely is no hell. But the reality is, is it talks about it over and over in Scripture. I don't know how often and how much you think about the fact of there is a, a, a God who is someday going to pour out his anger and his wrath. I don't know if you think about that often, but I think it's something that we, that until we, until we do so, we're not going to live our lives with the, this passionate goal of reaching lost people like Paul did until that becomes part of our thinking. And so what that is, is we're looking at people not just saying, look, in, in their situation, you know, it's not that people are just saved, you know, because they're lonely or because they got low self-esteem or they're not saved just because, you know, they're fearful. There is a real life consequence. All of us are going to die someday. And at that point, it's too late. Do we really look at people who are making choices that aren't following God and realize they're on a path, they're on a highway that's leading them directly to hell, this place of torment, this place of unquenchable fire, and that's for eternity? Do we truly believe that or think that? I think if we did, if we contemplated that on a daily basis, we would see people differently. And I think that's what drove Paul to take the gospel and to preach that message because he loved people and he didn't want to see anybody perish. God loves us. He doesn't want anybody to perish. You know, the world says, how could a loving God send people to hell? He, he, never, he never intended that to be the case. But we in our own will have chosen that if we haven't chosen Christ. So what are people getting saved from? They're getting saved from God's eternal wrath and his judgment for their sin. They're getting saved to eternal life with God in heaven. It's a crucial goal. It's realistic, it's worthy, it's crucial, and it's a compelling goal. Because it's so crucial, because people's lives are in the balance, the goal of saving some must grip our lives. When we see this passage in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul's passion to reach the lost comes out. These four verses that I read, go back and listen to this. Verse 19, he says, to win as many as possible. Verse 20, to win the Jews, to win those under the law. Verse 21, to win those not having the law. Verse 22, to win the weak, that by all possible means I might save some. Verse 23, and I do all of this for the sake of the gospel. Back in verse 16, he says, I'm compelled to preach He didn't control it. It controlled him. God filled him with his spirit and passion to do this. He was a man who was obsessed. And so I ask this question again. Does 
reaching out and reaching the lost and, and winning people to Christ, does that grip you? Is it your passion as it was Paul's? And I'd say today I'd have to confess to you and stand here in front of you. I've had three days to work on this message. And sometimes we have enough time, you know, I can work through all of this. I'm, I'm, I'm reading this going, okay, I'm convicted by this because I am too complacent about lost people going to hell. I need a new mission. I need a new passion to reach out to lost people. It's a goal that we must own, that by all possible means I might save some. The second point that I want to share with you this morning is that it's a message that we must proclaim. It's the gospel. The the truth is we can't save anyone. Paul says that I might save some. We we can't save anyone. Romans 1.16 says uh, the gospel, it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God to bring salvation to everyone who believes in him. That means that winning people to Christ doesn't require that I learn how to be a clever salesman. It's not me. It's not me trying to convince them. It's the gospel. The gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. So I don't have to be clever in my presentation. I don't have to be a salesperson. It it just means that I need to understand the gospel clearly so that I can just simply present it. All I need to do is present the gospel and let God do it from there. Micah Mack was our our speaker at our men's conference yesterday, and he said, look, presenting the gospel to your friends should take a minute. You don't have to preach a sermon. Just a minute or less, you can get all necessary just to, just to let them know. And here's the gospel in a nutshell. Three things. First, our problem is sin. We all have that problem. We have a sin problem. We're rebelling against the God who created us to know him and live in relationship with him. That sin has separated us. Romans 3.23 sin, Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of our sin is eternal death. Our problem is sin, but second, God's provision for our sin is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's God in human flesh, and he came to redeem us. He came to lay his life down. 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 29, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So we have a sin problem, but God's provision for our sin is Jesus Christ. He took the price for us. All we have to do is offer our life to him. So the third point is just this, our required response, trust in God's provision for us. His provision is Jesus Christ. He paid in full our sins, and whoever believes in him, John 3, 16 says, will not perish but have eternal life, whoever believes in him. So we turn from our sins and we give up our attempts to save ourselves, to get into heaven by our good works. You see, it just takes simply trusting in Jesus. And it's simple, I mean, a simple thing. We, we go to the doctor and we're sick and, and he writes a prescription. And if you ever just take time and you take it home and you sit on it for a few days to think, do I really trust him that this is the right thing that I should take? We take that prescription, we go right to the pharmacy, and we get it filled, and we start taking that whatever it is. He says, look, take this prescription, go home, take it, and, uh, and it's going to make you well. We trust the doctor. How many of you have ever flown on an airplane? Okay. I don't think you had a conversation with a pilot, but you getting on that plane and sitting down in a seat, you said, look, I believe in this guy's ability to get me where I need to go in this airplane. You don't even think about trusting. Why do we have such a trouble trusting God? Why do we have such trouble trusting Jesus to save us? He's done it all already. It's just us signing up for what he's already done. We can trust him. Trust him. That is all that we need to do. To win others to Christ, we present this simple good news, and that's this. You've sinned against God, but Jesus bore your penalty on the cross And if you'll just turn from your sin and trust him, believe in him, you'll be saved. That's our mission. That's it. Paul said this, I've become all things to all people so that by all possible means, 
I might save some. And I do this all for the sake of the gospel that I might share in his blessing. Today, two responses. First response to this message is this. Put your trust in Jesus as your Savior. Put your trust in him. And here's what I want to tell you, everybody in the room today. Stop playing games. Trust in Jesus. Stop playing games. Stop taking chances. Confess your sin to him and invite him into your life to save you. It's simple. He'll save you from the penalty of your sin on the day when he pours out his wrath. Don't be part of that. Be saved today. There's an eternal punishment in hell for the consequences of not following him. But by choosing him, you gain eternal life. Today, I, 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 I challenge you and encourage you, take that step. And so while everybody's looking, I'm not going to ask you to bow your heads today. This is the greatest thing that you could ever do in your life. And if you've never done this before, I encourage you to do it today. Trust Jesus. If you've trusted him before, but you've not, you're not walking with him today, and I have the feeling that there are many people in the room today that fall into this category. And you'd say, look, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna play games anymore. I'm not gonna take any more chances. Today, I wanna know and be sure. The Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. If today you wanna be saved, I wanna just invite you to stand where you're at. You may have been saved before, but you're not walking with him. Maybe you've never made that choice. Listen, we're all your fans here. There's nobody that's going to judge you. There's nobody that's going to criticize you. Actually, if you stand today and you make that decision, we're all going to cheer for you. That's what we're all about. So if that's you this morning, don't, don't, don't take a chance. Don't play any games. Nobody's judging you. We're all going to celebrate the fact that you give your life to Jesus. I'm only going to ask five, ten seconds most. If that's you, just go ahead and stand. For the rest of you that are sitting here. As I'm talking, you have realized too, okay, I'm not living with a purpose or a passion for lost people. Jesus saved my life, and I've just been going on doing my own thing, serving my own purposes, doing my own life stuff, and I haven't even taken time to think about people being lost and on their way to hell and on their way to eternal punishment. And today, the Holy Spirit is speaking to my heart to take up a new mission. And today you're committing to say, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose people, I'm gonna pray for them, and I'm gonna be willing to do whatever I can to lay down my rights in order that somebody else can be saved and set free. And today you'd say, I'm taking up a new mission with everybody looking around. I don't want you to stand up if this is not you, but if you today would say, today I'm gonna start a new mission. I'm writing some names down, I'm praying for them every day, and I'm gonna to speak to some people, and I'm gonna love some people, I'm gonna build some relationship with them, and I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna win them to Christ. That's my new mission. And if that's you this morning, would you just stand? I'm standing. Imagine if every one of us in the next month, reach someone with the message of the gospel and their life was changed through Jesus Christ. And that person was so passionate about that that they went to somebody else. Uh, and in, in two months' time here, we have no room for people. That's our mission. We're not about coming together and having a church service. We're about reaching lost people. It's a change of mind. It's a change of focus. It's a change of what our passions are about. And Paul's saying, look, by whatever means possible, meaning I'm going to lay down my right to do whatever I want to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm free to do some things. I'm free to live however I want to, but I'm choosing not to because I want my life to be an example and I want to reach some people. Let me pray for you. Father, today, as these are standing across this room, saying I, I'm going to live by a different mission. Today, the Holy Spirit is drawing me and leading me to get on task, to get on mission, and to, and to reach the world around me. God, I pray that you would put people in our hearts, 
and that even today, God, there's people that we may have conversations with this week to just let them know that there's somebody who's changed our life. It's Jesus Christ. Don't let fear stand in our way. Don't let complacency stand in our way. Don't let uh, just stuff of this world get in our way, but let we, that we would stay on task and on mission to reach our world, to reach our community, to reach the people that are in our world, in our workplaces, in our families, and in our homes with the message of the gospel of Jesus to save lives. Lord, if there's anyone in this room that didn't stand on my earlier call of saying, I'm going to say yes to Jesus. Pray that today they would open their heart to you, that they would say yes to you, and by confessing their sins and believing in Jesus, your word says that they will be saved. Save people here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Living a life of surrender, saying, God, I, you gave your life for me. I'm giving my life for you. So if you made a decision for Christ today, listen, I wasn't trying to put anybody on the spot, but the reality is it's going to be a whole lot better to stand here today than to lose later. So if you made that decision, would you come and tell one of the pastors, I'm going to be out here, fresh starter at the door, one of those places, find me, Pastor Weaver, one of the pastors, and just say, I made a decision. Stop at the Fresh Start Center. Uh, and, and let them know there's some materials that we can give you that will help you understand what that decision is all about. But we want to help you in that process as well. We're, we're in a mission here. Listen, we, we are a light. Not just our church, each one of us individually as Christ followers. We've been called to be salt and light to make a difference where we're at. And the challenge today is for us to look outward outside of ourselves, and to realize we're on a mission to follow Christ to love what he loves, and that's people. Let's love people. Amen? I'm going to be praying for you that uh, God will give you strength and help to follow through and not walk out these doors and forget what's happened.